Well, for those of you that are regular listeners to this podcast, you'll know that we made a pledge to help keep you up to date with everything generative AI, and today's episode is no exception. I'll be joined by Morgan Norris, a regular on this show, and we'll be talking about new tools that we're experimenting with, um, how to use AI while still being authentic to your brand and creating content that's trustworthy, and also the importance of creating an AI policy for your company. Let's do this. Welcome to Content Marketing Engineered, your source for building trust and generating demand with technical content. Here is your host, Wendy Covey. Hi, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. On each episode, I'll break down an industry trend, challenge, or best practice in reaching technical audiences. You'll meet colleagues, friends, and clients of mine who will stop by to share their stories. And I hope that you leave each episode feeling inspired and ready to take action. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a brief shout out to my agency, True Marketing. True is a full service agency located in beautiful Austin, Texas, serving highly technical companies. For more information, visit truemarketing.com. And now on with our podcast. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Content Marketing Engineered. Today, I'm welcoming back a regular guest on the show, Morgan Norris, who's the senior brand strategist and content strategist at True Marketing. Welcome, Morgan. Hi, thanks for having me. What's it like today in DC? It is going to be so hot. Um, We've had great weather. um, So nice. City's full of tourists. um, Lots of traffic. But today it's going to be Texas weather. So in the 90s. Uh, Oh, yeah. There you go. You'll join me. Well, here in Austin, the tourists are are, uh, present as well. (laughs) Uh, but, uh, that's okay. I'm out on the hill country, so I'm out of the fray of all that, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, today we're doing another episode of all things generative AI. And, um, this is, I think the third or fourth time now that we've done yeah. this it's early June to give context to when we're recording this. And, um, Morgan, just maybe before we get into, uh, all the updates that you have for us today, why is it important for engineering and industrial marketers to keep up with all things AI as you know they come about right now? Yeah, great question. So it's important because partially, if you are not staying on top of this, your competitors are. And so tools are evolving so quickly that there are constantly things popping up that can help you just work smarter, work more efficiently, um, free you up to focus time on things that are going to grow your business, maybe automate some tasks that uh, your staff doesn't love doing or automate things that normally just take a lot of time. Um, And so for us, I think staying on top of these tools means staying on top of what's new. And we're trying to kind of with these regular updates, give people the resources they need of here's a few things we've vetted. Here's some things to check out. And it's it's just helpful to kind of stay on top as you move forward because it's never, you know, the right time to get involved and to get up to speed was a month ago. But the second best time is today. Just jump in and start exploring some tools. So I want to give people the resources to do that. Good, good. And feel a little bit more in control rather than yes. careful. Yes. Of, yes. Of what's out there and where things are going because there's a lot of good that can come out of this. And then, you know, some concerning stuff that needs to be mitigated, which we'll talk about today as well. Yeah. Uh, good. Well, first topic, let's talk about how we can use AI to reach new audiences. Okay. This is a topic that I love. So as these tools are evolving, what happens is you think about technical audiences and Um, engineers and clients that we work with, we're spanning from new grads to people who are approaching retirement. And these types of people, that span of people consumes information in really different ways. And so a few things that are coming up are um, kind of video tools. So a lot of times we'll be working with maybe an organization that's been around for a longer time. They're trying to Um, attract new talent or their customers or younger engineers, man, they want some video. Um, They know our research shows that younger engineers are watching more video for work. Um, 
especially in comparison to older engineers, but sometimes that video just feels really, really hard to create. Um, it feels like a huge burden. You've got subject matter experts who are incredibly wise and experienced, but they don't want to be on camera. And so what does that look like? So there's a few tools um, that I've looked at recently. You did a demo of a, a tool called Gloss AI. It's just gloss.com. AI is the um, URL, but what they do is they can take uh, written content and create some kind of B-roll type of video out of that. It definitely is harder for super technical topics, um, just like we all know, finding imagery and B-roll that acutely shows kind of what it is that you're talking about. Um, it can be difficult, but you can get some kind of abstract video in the background um, with the voiceover uh, through their tool. And so that's really helpful. There's another one called Synthesia. And I actually got served up a video like this recently. Um, I picked up a medication from the pharmacy and then I got a text and it said, hear what the pharmacist has to say about this video. And sure enough, I clicked through and it's, it's a person there talking and it's all like lined up, but after using a couple of tools, exploring a couple of tools like this, I know that that is an AI created video. However, it is a person talking you through this kind of medication. And you can, you could see the benefit for that of even like help videos or things like that. There are people who will search through help forums to troubleshoot your products, but there are other people who they just want to talk to somebody or they just want to see kind of how something works. And so you, with Synthesia, you can actually just, you literally type in words, you pick out a person, you pick out like how they're, are they in a lab coat? Are they in, um, you know, kind of work attire and they will then read that script, um, but it's all auto generated. And so some of those tools are more expensive, but they're not as expensive as going to a production studio or having a professional videographer kind of come and do all this stuff on site. And so you're able to take the content that you already have and change formats to formats that were previously felt really unreachable um, mm, for you. I get you. So, okay. Boy, I, I'm yeah. not too mind to this. I mean, it sounds so efficient to be able to do that. And mm -hmm. I'm assuming that, you know, because you had a good experience when, when you saw it with the medication, um, that it doesn't have that weird look to it. Like some of it those doesn't. It early on, like Wally <laughs> pictures yeah. where people had like distorted eyes and stuff. So it doesn't. They, okay. So these look like real humans, even they though do. they're not. It's an mm -hmm. AI generated talking head. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think about the fact that, that, I mean, you're sort of representing this person as an employee, or maybe you're not, but you know what I'm saying? It's not really a person that works for your company. It's an AI generated person. You I think you've got to have a disclaimer. Trouble. You've got to have a disclaimer yeah. on there. Like when you yeah. see commercials and it's like, these are actors, these aren't um, right. actual, these aren't actual people using the product taking whatever. claritin and then jumping through the field of flowers yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay the Fair. disclaimers are a good are, analogy yeah the disclaimers are helpful and we'll talk about that i want to talk about that at the end about kind of okay. how you handle ai as a company and how you let people know what you're yeah. using so fair fair yeah. enough okay um yeah. good any other tools on your radar so um as far as another thing that we've used that I would really recommend, especially for technical audiences, is a tool called Chat PDF. So it takes the Chat PDF. Um, here's why I like it. With Chat PDF, you take a PDF. You take something that you have already created, some knowledge base. Um, that's a white paper or an ebook, or it's got all of your expertise in there. And then you can input that into chat PDF and start asking for specific kind of excerpts or summaries or a bulleted list or, yes. um, take, you this know, take this, what we've been waiting for. Yes. yes. Take this highly technical content and summarize it in 200 words at a 10th grade reading level. Oh, 
even like that. Even yeah, the level of okay, okay, yes. great movie. I love it. Right. So all okay. of a sudden, you can take that really technical paper that you wrote when your mom asks what you do, and you can put it in language that a non-technical person can understand. So it's things like that I think that are particularly valuable for our audience because what's so unique about um, kind of B2B technical communication is it's all of this IP that's stored within the minds of your subject matter experts and within your company. And to it, that information, a lot of times is actually, it's not sitting in chat GPT. I had a client mm -hmm. recently say, they're like, well, can't we just have chat GPT write something about this? Well, what the, what they were trying to write about was basically research that they have discovered um, recently in our productizing. Well, that's IP, it's patented IP um, that was even very recently patented. So chat GPT stopped collecting data a couple of years ago. Um, and so it doesn't hold the even the source material to describe what their technology is. However, if we do the due diligence with them and write up the technical paper, now we can use that as our base source material and start culling pieces from our material. So it's a much better approach than trying to ask a tool to write something that hasn't been created yet. So Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I just keep hearing more and more about people running into false sources. Oh, when they, so, so if you do ask ChatGPT and it's not out there, there's a, an, a chance it will just make up sources and make up stuff. So, yes. wow. Okay. <laughs> and do you, I'm, we haven't even talked about this before, but I actually had a tool, right? I was kind of like brainstorming. Um, so I'm using chat GPT to just give me some, just kind of get my mind flowing. Right. What was super interesting is it served up a couple of specific like products as answers. And I, I stopped like, um, I was asking it about, I was, I think I was even asking it about using AI tools or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it inserted a product that I then Googled, which was a specific, um, like AI technology for, it's like an older technology for, um, voice messages or something like that. And it, it just gave me pause for a second because I thought, huh, for them, that's potentially an opportunity for product placement or mm -hmm. am I being advertised to, to like yeah. through this process? So anyway, it's not something I've completely explored, but it was enough that right. I was like, uh, I don't like that. Right. Um, and if it was product placement, now we've lost the transparency of that, that we used to have in normal Google searches, right? Right, right. Right. And not even, Ooh. and anyway, so I don't think it was, I haven't heard anything like that, that they're doing that, but it just made me stop mm. and go, oh, that's definitely a possibility to come. Mm -hmm. Right. You think of yeah. where these things are headed and where they're going to go. And um, yeah, it would be like if Google served up sponsored content that didn't say sponsored on it. Um, so, yeah. Well, speaking of chat GPT, I've heard more and more people using it and Bard for a brainstorming buddy, right? Yeah. I, I hear a lot of people adopting that. I think that's an exciting use of those technologies. Just curious in your experience, and I think Jamie, I know she's been experimenting a lot. Which tool do you like better and why and how are they different? Yeah, Jamie um, really likes Bard and I trust Jamie a lot. So I'm kind of shifting that way. Um, I think that... I, my familiarity is a little bit more with chat GPT, though we're also starting to use some, a little bit stronger tools like writer, mm -hmm. um, which is a content development tool. And while chat GPT can help kind of answer questions or give definitions or summaries, writer is one that is designed to kind of work how a content developer works. So it'll sort of assist you along the way to topic ideation and then forming an outline. And then it'll kind of make suggestions along the way. 
And one thing I really like about Writer is they just implemented a feature where if you've got a specific, uh, like if it's pulling, if it's serving you up some information and there are data points in there, it'll highlight those and go, you need to fact check this. Like you, mm. the subject matter expert needs to yeah. fact check this. Okay. And so I think that, um, I think, Barred chat GPT for a ideation kind of tool for sure, but these more refined tools for specific purposes mm -hmm. are getting, they're getting better and smarter and even a little bit more human as they evolve. Um, doing, saying things like that, you need to fact check this or... Yeah it'll even, it'll produce something. It'll produce a few sentences and then it'll actually like call out its own writing and say, this sentence should be um, like streamlined. It's too wordy or something. And so <laughs> it's a cool resource in that yeah. way. And it, it's not, it's not presenting itself as the be all end all for content still requires a human. So yes, yes. And was, is it fair to say when it comes to original content development for, let's say, a white paper or a case mm -hmm. study, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily saving time yet using these tools for that original piece, but you're um, becoming, it, it, you have, I don't know, uh, help making it more creative or making it a stronger piece in some way. Yeah, I think some of that research gets streamlined. I think the time saving mm -hmm comes on the back end when you're then creating a, a blurb for an e-newsletter mm -hmm. or a, you know, um, a social media post or something like that. That's where a lot of the time savings comes Makes in. Sense. The derivative a, content. Yeah, yeah. Cause from a research perspective, even the tools are good for ideation, but at the same time, if you only used Wikipedia for your research, I would say you're probably not going to be very well read on a topic. Right. And so um, definitely still going out there to get kind of different opinions and stuff is helpful. Yeah. So where are some of these tools when it comes to search optimization? Yeah. So um, that's one thing that's helpful, like writer I'm not getting like search optimization help necessarily from mm -hmm. chat GPT um, or from Bard. I would say, I think we'll see those probably evolve though. I can't totally get my mind around the kind of eating your own dog food cycle of like Bing having Bard enabled and then but they are a search engine. So I'm not sure. Yeah, you want about to, you want to, you want yeah. the surface on the very tool you're asking to surface on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. But, but, so oh. there's that, but um, but the writing tools like Writer um or like Jasper will help you come up with kind of like good keywords or say they'll make recommendations on you can put in terms that you're kind of trying to focus on and then it'll help you integrate those in a, a little bit more of like a natural language type of way. Um, not overly creative though. What I'm finding with technical content is a lot of times you'll put in a really technical term or like more long tail type of term. And then the suggestions it'll come up with are, you know, if it was radio frequency signal generation or something that the, the it'll come up with what is radio frequency signal oh, generation, right. the, how the to use. Yeah. yeah. And so you're yeah. like, okay, that wasn't helpful. <laughs> so, so they're not a replacement for our tried and true tools like, um, like SEM brush and Moz and some of those specialized SEO tools. Yeah. I don't, not yet. Not mm -hmm. yet. I think we'll continue to see those integrations though. I think it'll get, and it's not going to be like, I think over time, the good writing tools and the good SEO tools will just start to come together more naturally um, yeah. for a better user experience. So, and, and that is Jasper is doing that somewhat. They've got an integration with an SEO company called Surfer. Um, I don't think it's as 
good yet for the kind of deeply technical stuff that we work on. Um, but I think probably from a consumer perspective, that's a pretty helpful tool right now. Okay, good deal. Yeah. Well, Morgan, as, as companies start to adopt AI, whether it's for content development or programming or all sorts of other functions, we, um, how do we, like, what do we do here about being a trusted brand and being authentic yeah. to who we are? How does that live alongside AI technology? Yep. So a couple of things I think, and I will keep saying this, but I think that as time goes on, we are going to crave individualized, um, not individualized, but, um, authentic content because everybody can go produce an, an answer with these tools. Right. But I think that we are going to continue to want to see people that we know we can trust. We're going to want to hear people talk. We're going to want to, um, want to be in like the physical presence of people who are experts in their field. And so one thing that keeps coming up is this kind of trust and authenticity. So I think um, this goes a lot of different ways. So I think back to doing um, like we might, we would do a website for a manufacturing company that had a lot of their manufacturing at their in-house facility in the US. And those clients were so proud of that because they had so much control over what was happening in their manufacturing facility that a lot of times they would want a video inside their manufacturing facility because that spoke volumes to their customers to show we are doing all of this stuff in-house. We've got our eyes on it. And look, here's a video. You can come visit our manufacturing facility. You can walk through it. And I think that that type of authenticity and transparency is going to continue to be important. So like for designers, this might look like a time lapse of CAD drawings, right? For writers, this looks like your drafts. Um, it looks like seeing how you've input your own voice in there. It looks like quotes from subject matter experts at your company. Um, it might look like, you know, for coders, this looks like kind of screenshots of how you've gotten through the process to get to this really authentic end result. And you've showed human oversight at each point in the mm -hmm. process. And so I think that that's going to be important and people need to kind of every AI tool you use, you need to take a step back and say, what's the kind of human oversight here and how do we show that we're being authentic in, in what we do. Um, and I think that'll continue to be really really valued yeah. as we go forward. I go back to, to what you said about how writer says fact check this and fact check this. And, yeah. and so just how you need to be very diligent about knowing where your claims come from, where your information comes from and um, doing that research, you know, yeah. knowing your sources. Yeah. Well, and so then that speaks to kind of creating internally within your company some kind of AI policy. And this, you can come at it from a lot of different angles, but if you've got a large organization or small, um, what if you find out a year from now that your one of your teams or even just an individual employee has been using some tool without enough human oversight, um, and then now you've created problems that surface later. So by kind of creating an internal document of this is how we handle AI within the company um, is something that I would urge every company to do. Uh, we published something recently that, um, a blog post recently, uh, that people can even just use as a framework. But the first things you've got to look at are the kind of legal ramifications. The government has asked us to consider data protection and privacy, IP, liability, discrimination bias, and then security in any endeavor, right? Um, but we look at how those how those relate to AI. We've talked about before, um, solely AI generated works can't be copyrighted. Um, we've talked about uh, the fact that most AI, generative AI platforms 
require a terms checkbox that states something to the effect of whatever you put in this tool can then be accessed by the tool. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't heard like horror stories of things like that happening yet, but we do, we are very click happy to just, yeah, sure, whatever, get me through the terms box so that I can get to what I want. But you think about that and you think about, well, what if you're putting in, you know, product information or IP that is not out there in the world? I think about uh, public companies um, uh, kind of putting material news in there that's not yet announced and things like that. We will see some stuff like that that becomes a problem. So that just that very first one, data protection and privacy, just taking a step back and going, oh, as a company, let's make sure we're not we're not using a tool, we're not putting anything in a tool that we wouldn't put out in the public, right? Yeah. So it's things like that. And then kind of writing a corporate statement that answers the questions of how you use AI, how it contributes to what you offer to customers, who's accountable for anything created by AI. And mind you, that answer should be the company. If you're if you're giving something out. Um, if you used an AI tool to create it, the liability is still on you. Mm -hmm. um, that's still, you're claiming that as your, can't go back and blame a tool. Um, what limits do you have on AI? And then what level of transparency do you have with the tools that you use? So those are kind of the questions that you could sit around a table with marketing, with um, internal communication, with engineering, with sales, and get everybody on the same page so that when new tools come up or new processes come up, you at least have a framework to work through to decide what to do. Yes. And I don't know why, but this brings to mind recently, there was an attorney that got in deep water. And if you read about this, where he used AI to come up with his whole, whatever it was, case consideration, and it had fake um, precedents listed oh, in it that the AI tool just served up. And he, you know, you just ran with it, didn't fact check it. And um, now will be kind of the first attorney. And I don't know what's going to happen to this person, but it's okay. So the company, were they aware he was using AI to do his job? Was he using it appropriately? Obviously not. Was yeah. it fact checking it? Not enough humor, human intervention mm -hmm. and look at the result. And of course, to your point, that law firm can't just say, well, it's AI's fault. Right. Because they served us up you know, false information. I mean, absolutely. Come on. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, as a marketer, obviously they're one component of this larger AI policy, but you know, if your company doesn't have one today, um, the marketers can certainly uh, lead the charge or, or be the catalyst to say, yeah. we, we need to get something out there and help communicate that. Yep. For sure. And that, um, that we kind of published something on our site to that point. And it's definitely tweaked towards kind of marketing and how we use AI tools for marketing. We're also really transparent about what tools that we use. So I think this is interesting. And I think as time goes on and in the name of transparency, um, being able to say, here's, we use a tool called like Happy Scribe to transcribe this podcast or um, we use it's things like that, that there might be tools that you're already using that you don't even know. Um, but we've said kind of what we are and aren't using tools for, um, and what, what those tools are. I don't think there's any hindrance in giving that transparency because when clients start to ask questions, when your customers start to ask questions, they're wondering, are you, I, I think, and in my experience, clients are wondering kind of, are you, are you using a tool to do something that now I could be doing myself? Or are you using a tool to do something way faster or cheaper and now I'm overpaying for it? And so I think we want to get ahead of those and say, here's, here's what we do. Here's how we use them. Here's what we, what we don't use them for um, yeah. as we start to kind of adjust and move forward. You shouldn't be afraid to say that. If you are, you need to evaluate what you're doing and how you're relating to your clients. Yeah. Trust and authenticity, right? I got yep. all kept full circle back to that. Yeah, for uh, sure. Good. Well, Morgan, so as I mentioned, it's early June right now. So depending yeah. on when someone is listening to this, we have an upcoming webinar uh, that would, I believe, be on demand afterwards. But tell me yep. a little bit about your webinar. 
Yeah. So for the webinar, we are going to, we'll talk about kind of some of the stuff, putting policies in place, and then we're going to talk about prompting um, and how to use generative AI for B2B content development. The webinar is on June 15th at noon central time, and it'll be live. We're going to do some live prompting, which should be fun um, because a tool is going to spit out something different every time you use it and right, so right. um you can see how i do it on on the fly there but what's happening is the ip that you insert into a tool or the the prompt that you insert into a tool really becomes like your ip it becomes kind of your source code for what is going to come out of it and so crafting really deep specific prompts will start to help you get better content out of a tool or even a better starting point um, or better brainstorm buddy, right? I, if I bring in an intern that's never, it's their first day, they're probably not gonna have great ideas, but if they've sat in meetings for the whole semester and then they come in and I wanna hear what they think, they probably have a lot better ideas. So we can kind of give some of that information to a tool and get better out of it. So we'll work through that. Great. Okay. Well, I I will put a link to that webinar in the show notes. Yeah. And otherwise, uh, I know we have a a, a live document that you're keeping uh, up to date. A generative I uh, generative AI guide for mm -hmm. industrial marketers. So yeah. I'll put a link to that. And um, anything else? No. From that guide, you can also click out and see our policy. And I would just encourage people. Feel free to use that as a guidepost. We used um, the Marketing AI Institute's guide as a, an initial guidepost. And so um, that's licensed under Creative Commons. You can use it, but I would go from there. Just start somewhere. Great. All right. Well, thanks for your time today, Morgan. Right. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today on Content Marketing Engineered. For show notes, including links to resources, visit truemarketing.com slash podcast. While there, you can subscribe to our blog and our newsletter and order a copy of my book, Content Marketing Engineer. Also, I would love your reviews on this podcast. So please, when you get a chance, subscribe and leave me your review on your favorite podcast subscription platform. Thanks and have a great day.